trustee, member Harold H. Hines, Jr. Mr. Hines provided exceptional leadership to North Shore, having served as chairman of the executive, development, insurance, faculty and student governance, and long-range planning committees. In addition, Mr. Hines was president of the Board of Trustees from 1971 to 1973, and he chaired North Shore's 50th Anniversary Endowment Fund campaign. Mr. Hines' connection with the North Shore ran even deeper, however, as his three children graduated from North Shore as lifers. And his wife, Mary Pick Hines, who is with us this evening, is a distinguished alumna of the school and has served on the alumni board and is a current member of our board of trustees. In his memory, North Shore endowed a visiting fellowship which annually brings to campus a distinguished individual who articulates the school's philosophy, live and serve. Special emphasis is placed on the ethical considerations of social issues, giving students the opportunity to define more clearly their responsibility in society. The school community's exposure to the fellows should expand existing perceptions in a constructive way, thus creating a living testimonial to the ideals of Harold Hines, to the idea to the ideals Harold Hines exemplified. Past Harold Hines visiting fellows have included the late A. Bartlett Giamani, president of Yale University, Dr. Jane Goodall of the Jane Goodall Institute, Gary Wu, Chinese dissident, author, and human rights activist, Miller Fuller, founder and president of Habitat, Habitat for Humanity, and Russell A. Mittermeier, president of Conservation International. I would like to introduce Sabrina Monshine, a member of the North Shore class of 2001, who will have the honor of introducing this year, year's Harold H. Hines, Jr. Visiting Fellow. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, a sociologist, is a professor of education at Harvard University. Since 1972, she has been interested in studying the culture of schools, the patterns and structures of classroom life, the relationships between adult de developmental themes and teachers' work, and socialization within families, communities, and schools. Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot has written six books, Worlds Apart, Relationships Between Families and Schools, Beyond Bias, Perspectives on Classrooms, and The Good High School, Portraits in, of Character and Culture. Her book, Balm and Gilead, Journey of a Healer, which won the 1988 Christopher Award, given for literary merit and humanitarian achievement, was followed by I've Known Rivers, Lives of Loss and Liberation, and the Art and Science of Portraiture. In her most recent book, Respect and Exploration, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot reaches deep into human experience to find the essence of this powerful quality. In her lecture this evening entitled, Will Anyone Know Who I Am? on Witness, Justice, and Respect. She will speak on educational themes drawn from respect. In addition to her teaching, research, and writing, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot sits on numerous professional <coughs> committees and boards of directors, including the National Academy of Education, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. She has also been the recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Prize Award, Harvard George, Harvard's George Ledley Prize, given for research that makes the most valuable contribution to science and the benefit of mankind, and 17 honorary degrees. She was the recipient of the Emily Hargrove Fisher Endowed Chair at Harvard University, upon her which upon her retirement, will become the Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot Endowed Chair making her the first African-American woman in Harvard's history to have an endowed professorship named in her honor. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. great parade of people who have become Harold Hines Visiting Fellows. It's really a distinguished and wonderful group. And I thank Sabrina for the wonderful introduction 
Sabrina was part of a group of students who I met together with this afternoon in a very spirited and interesting conversation about respect and about our lives and about the communities we are creating and, and nourishing. Um, I also want to thank um, everyone I met today here at the school. It's been a wonderful, wonderful welcome. Uh, the headmaster, Tom Dore, uh, the former head, Julie um, Hall, and her husband, Parker Hall, who I know from another life, the life that I had at Swarthmore College, where we all went, uh, where we all sit, have, at one time or another, sat on the board. And I particularly want to say thank you to Mary Hines for her husband and his life, and for herself, because as I understand it, she is a most inspiring, generous, and thoughtful, wise leader of this institution, and she's carrying on a wonderful legacy. So with that, I'd like to begin this talk called, Will Anybody Know Who I Am? on Witness, Justice, and Respect. As I said, I'm delighted to be here at North Shore Country Day School and honored to be the Harold Hines Visiting Fellow. I have enjoyed reading through some of your catalogs, bulletins, newsletters, and curriculum guides, trying to discern how you represent yourselves to the wider world, listening for the language that you use, and the values and goals that you profess. The documents I've reviewed, confident but not self-congratulatory, lucid but not simple, imaginative but deeply grounded, express a commitment to nourishing the development of the whole child, mind, body, psyche, and spirit. They speak about supporting the coexistence and interdependence of educational quality and equity, about celebrating diversity in all of its myriad forms, visible and invisible, and about building an intentionally inclusive and embracing community. There are also earnest passages about the gifts of service, about nurturing the goodness within individuals and, and within the culture of your school. Passages as well about fostering relationships among faculty and students that inspire <coughs> trust and truth-telling, challenge imagination and intellects, and have mutual respect at their center. Of course, we all say these things, and on our best days, we mean what we say. But we also know the difference between rhetoric and reality. This is particularly true, I think, when we talk about the tough challenges of living dignity and living diversity in schools. I believe that the rhetoric and public discourse about diversity, multiculturalism, pluralism, have over the years begun to sound stale and practiced much too facile, even as we recognize how very hard and complex the work of authentic inclusivity turns out to be. It may not surprise you that the core values and ambitions, ambitious goals that shape the mission of the North Shore Country Day School are also <coughs> themes that have been central preoccupations in my life and in my work. I have also worried a lot about how difficult those goals are to accomplish, both institutionally and individually, about the great distance between our expressed values and our daily habits. And I've worried about finding new ways of addressing our chronic laments and our tired rhetoric. The opportunities and casualties of our quest for diversity, then, have been major and minor notes in my siren song particularly for the last few years, as I've explored in my research and in my writing, the contours and dimensions of respect, as I have tried to shape a reconstructed view of this beautiful term. I believe that respect is the single most important ingredient in creating authentic relationships and in building healthy communities. I remember feeling the power and majesty of respect and the deep connections between respect and justice at an unforgettable moment of grace. It was April of 1986 at the burial and requiem for my father, 
Charles Radford Lawrence II. My brother Chuck was giving the eulogy, his intimate and loving view of a very public man. Chuck's voice cracked as he recalled one of our father Charles's loveliest qualities. And I'm now quoting from my brother's eulogy. Our father Charles had a natural air of authority about him. He commanded respect without ever asking for it. In high school, my rowdiest friends, the guys who stole hubcaps and crashed parties, were perfect gentlemen in my father's presence. They'd stand and say, yes, sir, Dr. Lawrence, and answer his many questions about school and home and where their parents and grandparents were from. It was much later that I realized Dad's secret. He gained respect by giving it. He talked and listened to the fourth grade kid in Spring Valley who shined shoes the same way he talked and listened to a bishop or a college president. He was seriously interested in who you were and what you had to say. And although he had the intellectual and physical tools to outmuscle a smaller person or mind, he never bullied. He gained your allegiance by offering you his strength not by threatening to overpower you." End quote. In my brother's words that day, I heard the recovery of rich meanings of respect. Through my tears, I heard the lovely symmetry and reciprocity, not the static hierarchy. I heard the tender transfer of authority, not the power plays. I heard the deep curiosity the need to know, the urge to understand, not the arrogance of knowing enough or knowing it all. And I heard the beauty in the ordinary daily gestures, not the drama and glory of great public moments. I am sure that my brother's words of gratitude and loving farewell have burned their way into my heart, fueled my interest in respect, and shape the way I understand and interpret its meanings. As an educator and as a researcher, I have also seen the power of respect in schools and classrooms, seen the ways in which respect is crucial in nourishing and sustaining relationships between teachers and students. In the last 25 years, for example, I have visited literally hundreds of schools across the country, from city schools in poor communities to affluent suburban schools, from remote rural schools to elite preparatory academies. And in all of them, I have asked students to identify their good teachers and to tell me why they think they are good. The students' answers across all of these diverse settings are always the same. Why do we think Mrs. Browning is a good teacher? They asked me incredulously, as if I should know the answer. Because, they say, she respects us. I push further, trying to discover what they mean by respect. Again, there's no reluctance, there's no ambivalence in their response. They feel respected by teachers who make them feel visible and worthy who are demanding, who hold high standards for them, who insist that they learn. And they feel disrespected or dissed by teachers who never bother to get to know them, who let them off easy, who do not take them seriously or believe that they can be successful. Respect grows in relationships of expectation, challenge, and rigor. It is diminished by inattention, indifference, and empty ritual. In a beautiful piece titled, A Gathering of Gifts, by my sister, I bring my family with me. My siblings are on either side, and all together we're invincible. <laughs> so this is a piece by my sister, Paula Lawrence Waymiller a masterful and compassionate educator, a poetic writer, and now an Episcopal priest. 
She recalls the weeks of grueling anticipation before her first day of kindergarten and speaks about the primal fears that we all experience when we enter new communities. Her story rehearses the raw feelings of vulnerability and the yearning for visibility and voice, the desire to be known. So I quote from Paula's piece. It is 1951, and summer has come to a steady, hot, quiet hum in August. A healthy amount of boredom in the air begins to let the summer end, making way for anticipation of my first day of kindergarten, the beginning of school. My brand new first day of school dress hangs on the mirror over my bureau. Red plaid, I think, with a white collar. New cotton undies and slip and soft white ankle socks are folded <coughs> on the bureau. And in an open shoebox with white tissue paper unfolded enough to see them are my, my new red school shoes. My mother had told the salesman something sturdy in a school shoe. I had been picturing bright red patent leather party shoes and was crestfallen when Sturdy signaled the salesman to bring out brown with a tie. Mom and I must have persevered each with our own image of what my first school shoes would be because I ended up with ox blood, red leather with a double strap and double buckles. Pretty, but sturdy. Handsome was my father's peacemaking word for the compromised shoes. Every end of August night before going to bed, I would carefully lift the shoes out of the crisp paper, smell the fresh new leather, put them on the floor next to my feet and think, I am going to school. I'm going to step up the big high steps onto scary Mr. Gerke's scary big school bus where I've heard that the big kids chant, kindergarten baby, stick your head in gravy, when the little kids get on. I'm going to a real school in a strange new place. Will anybody know who I am? The big question, will anybody know who I am? For teachers and students across the developmental spectrum, from kindergarten through graduate training, the question is the same. And respect is a potent, omnipresent concept. It is on our tongues and embedded in our rhetoric. It is central to our value frameworks and institutional missions. And it shapes our daily actions and interactions. It is, therefore, both practical and prophetic. By now, I'm sure you gather that my view of respect challenges traditional conceptions of the term. Let me briefly tell you what I mean by respect, identify what I think are its key dimensions, focus on the quality of respect that I find one of the most surprising and generative, and look at the work and wisdom of a practitioner of respect who embodies this quality. So first, let me tell you what I mean by respect. Respect is commonly seen as deference to status and hierarchy. Usually, respect is seen as involving some sort of debt due people because of their attained or inherent position, their age, their gender, their class, their race, their professional status or accomplishments. Whether defined by the law, rules of law, or the habits of culture. Respect often implies required expressions of esteem, approbation, or submission. 
By contrast, I focus on the ways that respect creates symmetry, empathy, and connection in all kinds of relationships, even those such as parent and child, teacher and student, employer and employee, commonly seen as unequal. Rather than looking for respect as a given in certain relationships, I'm interested in watching it develop over time. I believe that respect generates respect. A modest loaf becomes many. With that in mind, I'm interested in how people work to challenge and dismantle hierarchies rather than how they reinforce and reify them, as well as with the ways in which the organizational context shapes the ways in which people engage in respectful relationships. Since I focus on individuals, it is important to consider how family roots, temperament, and life stories shape the ways in which they are able to become respectful and respected. Rather than the language of inhibition and constraint, typical of a more old-fashioned view of respect, I listen for the voices of challenge and exuberance. Rather than the language of dutiful compliance, I hear the voices of desire and commitment. Rather than the broad and esoteric abstractions of philosophers, so distant from the complexities of people's lives, I watch for the details of action and try to decipher the nuances of thought and feeling. In my book, I identify six dimensions of respect not to be heard <coughs> as discrete ingredients of a prescribed recipe, but rather as a framework for considering the rich experiential complexity of the term. Each dimension reveals a different angle of vision. So let me name the dimensions and say a little bit about each one. The first dimension is empowerment. When we are respectful, of others, we want to offer them the knowledge, skills, and resources that they need that will allow them to make their own decisions and take control of their lives. The second dimension is healing. In showing respect for another, we hope through our work and through our actions to nourish a feeling of worthiness, wholeness, and well-being in them. The third dimension is dialogue. In showing respect for another, we encourage authentic communication. We listen carefully, respond supportively. We are willing to move through misunderstandings, distortions, conflict, and anger toward reasoning and reconciliation. The fourth dimension, and the one on which I will focus my remarks this evening, is curiosity. When we are respectful of others, we are genuinely interested in them. We want to know who they are and what they are thinking, feeling, and fearing. We want to know their stories and we want to know their dreams. The fifth dimension of respect is, of course, self-respect. In order to show respect to another, we must feel good about ourselves. Self-respect, however, must not be confused with narcissism or entitlement. It results from a growing self-confidence that does not seek external validation or public affirmation. It is learning to live by our own internal compass, one defined by a daily private vigilance. And the final dimension of respect that I explore is attention. When we are respectful of another, we offer our full, undiluted attention. We are fully present, we are completely in the room, sometimes engaged in vigorous conversation, sometimes bearing silent witness. I want to talk to you this evening about curiosity and its messenger, a man named Dayud Bey. Because I think it is perhaps the quality of respect 
that surprises and enhances our view more than any other. Curiosity. It seems so innocent, so ordinary, so doable. And it seems to be the least tainted by political hype or tired rhetoric. It also seems so fundamental to relationships of all kinds. Relationships between lovers, between parents and children, between teachers and students, between employers and employees, among colleagues. All kept alive by genuine curiosity, by wanting to know and be known by the search for knowledge, by discovery, openness, and attention to newness and change, by making oneself vulnerable to hearing things painful or coherent, incoherent. And curiosity is fundamental to the quest for justice and the commitment to inclusivity. Individually and institutionally, we must be genuinely interested in the stranger's voice and in the challenges and in the opportunities that his or her perspective will bring. As an artist and as a photographer, Dayud Bey creates larger than life-size color portraits that allow us to see into the psyche of his subjects. His pieces hang everywhere, in the Met in New York, um, and all over the place, the Whitney Museum and the Guggenheim, um, Chicago Art Institute, other places. When Dayud talks about his work and his art, he points to the development of a relationship with his subjects at the center of his work. If most of us think of photographers with a camera held up in front of their faces using their equipment as mask or barrier, hiding out while they expose others, then Dayud Bey stands in defiant contrast he believes that photographers must enter into relationships with their subjects that are mutual and symmetric, where both photographer and subject are unmasked, making way for trust and dialogue. Dayud's photography is more about discovery, more about finding out what is true for each person through listening to his or her stories than it is about presenting a likable portrayal. For him, photography begins always with a deep curiosity. I'm endlessly curious, he says, about the primary motivation that defines his respectful regard of the people with whom he works. In his early 20s, Dayud began his career hanging out in the streets of central Harlem in New York City. Streets that were both exotic and familiar to this middle-class black boy from Queens. For five years, from 1975 to 1980, he worked to develop his unique approach to making pictures about the human experience. His hanging out was methodical. He would select a particular area, usually a 10 block square, say from 125th Street to 135th Street, moving from east to and he would land there each day with his 35 millimeter camera hanging around his neck. For several days, he wouldn't take any pictures, just stand around, approach people, and begin a conversation. Sometimes he'd go to the same bus stop for several days in a row and begin to recognize the people who would arrive there at the same time each day. They would also begin to notice him, and eventually they'd strike up a conversation. This was very hard for me, admits Dayoud. I was an incredibly shy person by temperament. As a child, I was very reticent, a stutterer, real fearful of reaching out. I think making pictures was the way I began to engage people, the way I came out of my shyness. But even as a novice, Dayoud knew that photographs grew out of relationships and that the process had to be reciprocal. This reciprocity usually emerged out of the sharing of stories. Courageously pushing past his reticence, Dayud forced himself to reach out to folks and make a connection. Sometimes he had to begin the storytelling in order for people to feel moved to carry on, 
But once the ball got rolling, he found that one story encouraged others. Before you knew it, afternoon had slipped into evening and an atmosphere of reciprocity had emerged. The stories were usually inspired by a question, by genuine curiosity about the other person, and the curiosity could not be faked. Despite his shyness, Dayu thinks that part of the reason he was able to learn how to reach out to people was because his father was an amazingly friendly and gregarious man who had the ability to engage everyone. He could stand on the street all day and enjoy, and enjoy talking to anybody about anything. Dayud remembers how his father, Ken, would stop and talk to the man selling hot dogs on the street corner. His curiosity was provoked by anybody. He'd ask the guy how long he'd been selling hot dogs, who his supplier was, how much profit he made, how many hot dogs he sold each afternoon, and so on, endlessly curious. But it was not only that Ken was eager to engage in conversation that amazed his son. It was also his ability to connect with all kinds of people, whatever their status or station. Ken had been an electrical engineer by training, and he usually held the position of manager or director in whatever shop he worked. But he never used the power of his, his position to diminish others or to pull rank. Dayud remembers visiting his dad at work and never having the sense that he was the boss. He had an easy relationship with all the men and women who worked with him. Dayud loved his father's curiosity, his gregariousness, and his even-handed way that he dealt with everyone around him. Even though he grew up feeling awkward and shy, so different from his father's ease and cool, he must have absorbed some of his social inheritance. In his early days, meeting people and taking pictures in Harlem, a part of his father seemed to grow up in him. After working with the 35 millimeter camera for several years, Dayu decided that he wanted to slow down the way he was working in order to force a more sustained relationship with the person he was photographing. He switched to taking pictures with a black and white 4x5 Polaroid camera, a camera that produces an instant print and a negative, and a camera that required that he set up a tripod every time he would shoot a series of pictures. With a 35 millimeter camera, he explains, you can be invisible. You can take 10 pictures without people even noticing. I had begun, he says, have ethical problems with using the person as unwitting participant. With the four by five camera, on the other hand, you have to get a commitment from the subject. You have to ask someone to stand in front of you, be still, and cooperate. I wanted to get that act of consent. The idea of consent was especially important to Dayu, working in the black community. He not only felt that it was crucial that he construct an alternative set of images of African Americans, he also believed that the process of the work, the process of the work, needed to express a respect for the dignity of his subjects, that the process needed to be deeply relational and fundamentally human. I wanted to avoid, he says, the hierarchy and voyeurism of traditional photography where the power always rests with the photographer. The process could not be separated from the image. Dayud explains the equation. If I wanted the pictures to have a more intense quality, then the relationships needed to be more intimate and more reciprocal. I needed to build up a series of relationships slowly and patiently. When Dayud Bey describes the curiosity and commitment that are part of his work and the depth and complexity that he strives for, he takes me on a flashback to his second grade teacher at PS 123, a public school filled with African American teachers and students in Queens, one of the boroughs of New York City. 
When he photographs his subjects and bathes them in light, he wants them to feel seen in the way he felt seen in Mrs. Jones's classroom. Mrs. Jones, he recalls, was profound and extraordinary and very inspiring. In what way, profound, I ask, somewhat surprised at a word that seems to go beyond most people's recall of second grade. His response is immediate. She established real relationships with every single child in her class. Everything was possible and everyone could do it. Ever since second grade, all of Dayud's other teachers and all of his other educational experiences have been measured against Mrs. Jones's amazing skill and compassion. And they have all come up wanting. By the third grade, Dayud's parents had enrolled their son in PS 131, a higher achieving white school where he was the only black child in his class where he remembers feeling an uneasy, unnamed anxiety every time he stepped off the bus and into the school. Dayud recalls an incident in fourth grade when one of the little girls got her lunch stolen, and he looked up to find a teacher singling him out. He saw her cold stare and her accusatory finger waving in his face, and he felt baffled and confused. I was innocent. I didn't even get the connection, he recalls. Me, he stammered. Are you talking to me? Yes, she meant him. And he was to go down to the guidance office immediately. He was the culprit. There was no doubt in her mind. Dayud rose up from his seat, walked the long mark to the door amid the quiet stares of his classmates, and dutifully took himself to the guidance office where the counselor interpreted his acting out as some kind of mental problem and gave him some weird test putting square pegs in round holes. In Dayud's memory, this is one story among many. I get singled out, he recalls. Much of the time I was in a conflicted state. There were strange things going on, but I didn't want, know what to say. I couldn't name what was happening, and I couldn't find the words or the courage to ask. The following year, in fifth grade, he remembers that the class was writing a group play on colonial America, and the play was to be written in verse. Dayud loved the assignment, and he leapt right into the middle of the work. The teacher was gratified by the way her class pulled off the assignment so quickly and with such apparent ease and mature collaboration. She inquired of everyone how they had been so incredibly productive, and the children all pointed to Dayud, who smiled back shyly. I remember, says Dayud, with hurt in his eyes, how her expression changed in that moment. The raised eyebrow, the amazement, the surprise, she must have applauded his inspired work and thanked him for his contribution. But the only thing that Dayud can remember is her utter bafflement and his inner confusion. The teacher was unable to reconcile Dayud's brightness with her stereotype of him. How could this black boy produce this verse? She seemed tormented by this. Dayud's tales of being painfully understood, the ways in which his fourth and fifth grade teachers were blinded by their prejudice, remind me of the opening passages of Ralph Ellison's classic novel, Invisible Man, a book published just before Dayud Bey was born. And I quote from the opening paragraphs of Ellison's book. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, 
of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows. It is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me." End quote. The plight of Ellison's invisible man echoes through Dayud's later childhood stories. He suffered what Ellison describes as the construction of their inner eyes. And he learned the hard way that to exist, we must be visible. The contrast between the biased oversight of his teachers at PS 131 and the full empathic attention bestowed by Mrs. Jones surely influenced Dayud's approach to his art. His photo photographs, motivated by curiosity, shaped by commitment to his subjects and their consent and participation, allow his subjects to express themselves bathed in respectful attention. Our view of knowing, really seeing the whole person, might be informed by Dayud Bey's masterful and compassionate lens. Threaded through his stories, we see the daily acts of justice, the warm embrace of inclusivity, and the relentless curiosity that says yes, yes, to little sister Paula's haunting question, will anybody know who I am? So in closing this evening, let me mention seven lessons because I can't ever resist being the teacher. That I believe are important for those of us who want to honor and enact the mission of the North Shore Country Day School. And welcome the exciting and difficult challenges of making good schools even better. For those of us committed to embracing diverse voices, identities, frames of mind, and learning styles. And for those of us who want to build families, schools, and communities based on relationships of respect. So I want to close with seven very challenging lessons. And the first lesson is on symmetry. We need to reconstruct our images of and metaphors for respect. The old views of respect that emphasize hierarchy, approbation, and obedience based on habit, ritual, or law tend to lead to relationships that are static, asymmetric, and constraining. People become stuck in their roles of power or impotence responsibility or irresponsibility, and are neither challenged nor inspired to try on other personas or develop new ways of being. Respect that is symmetric and dynamic, on the other hand, supports growth and change, encourages communication and authenticity, and allows generosity and empathy to flow in two directions. The image is one of a circle, not a triangle or a pyramid. From this new perspective, differences in power, strength, and expertise may remain, but the respect creates a relational and generative equality. My second lesson is on relationship. Respect grows in relationship, and it is shaped by the context. One cannot possibly envision respect in the abstract. It is grounded in individual reciprocity and engagement, defined by the immediacy of the moment and the constraints of the setting. 
It is visceral, palpable, conveyed through gesture, nuance, tone of voice, and figure of speech. One of the reasons that to dis, to dis, has become a verb spoken by all of us. I hope that's true here in Winnipeg. <laughs> Certainly true in Boston. To dis has become a verb spoken by all of us, not just cool talking adolescents. It's because it seems to capture in one sharp syllable the potency of respect not given, the moment when we are suddenly made to feel dismissed, diminished, and demeaned. Those of us seeking to nourish respect then must see its embeddedness in growing relationships and appreciate the immediate and visceral way that it is transmitted. My third lesson tonight is on civility. It is important that we not confuse respect with civility. Although these notions are related, they are certainly not the same. Civility refers to the rituals, routines, and habits of decorum that characterize a gracious encounter. We think of the etiquette of politeness and manners, an important but I believe relatively surface engagement. Respect certainly includes attention to these rituals of civility, but it goes deeper. It penetrates below the polite surface and reflects a growing sense of connection, empathy, and trust. It requires seeing the other as genuinely worthy. My fourth lesson is on storytelling. Storytelling is at the center of respectful encounters. Stories lubricated by genuine curiosity, authentic questions, and attentive listening. Stories also allow for rapport and identification across the boundaries of class, race, gender, prejudice, and fear. Through the unique and specific aspects of each other's stories, we discover the universals among us. And stories are not exclusive property. One story invites another, as people's words weave the tapestry of human connection. And my fifth lesson is on language. If we are to make progress towards an authentic pluralism, a real diversity of voices in our schools, then I think we have to listen carefully to the language we use and get rid of code labels like inner city, like at risk, like urban, that are masked for words we refuse to say in the politically correct environment we tend to inhabit. And we have to strike, or at least revive and reinvest in, tired terms like multiculturalism and diversity that have lost their punch and lost their challenge. One of the reasons I love the word curiosity is because it is so plain, so core, so untarnished. If we really practice curiosity, we will be genuinely interested in understanding the colors and differences in our midst. We will be eager to get to know the stranger. My sixth and penultimate lesson is on family origins. The imprint of family is powerful in shaping the ways we each negotiate respectful relationships. As we try to create relationships that are nourishing and challenging, that have respect at their center, we often confront the ghosts of our parents, 
the haunts of our early experiences as a child. These echoes can be inspiring. We create relationships that may have the imprint of our parents' empathy and generosity. This was the good fortune of Dayud Bey, who inherited his father's irrepressible <coughs> warmth and curiosity. But others of us must work to challenge harsh and troubling generational echoes. We have to try hard not to unleash on others the assaults our parents wittingly or unwittingly inflicted upon us. Our determination to become teachers and healers may in fact be inspired by the deep residues of pain inflicted by abusive parents. As teachers and parents engaged in respectful encounters, we hope to do the opposite, act out of compassion and empathy, restraint and connection, and in so doing, heal ourselves. And after all of these words and all of this talk this evening, my final lesson is on silence. Respect is not just carried through talk. It is also conveyed through silence. I do not mean an empty, distracted silence. I mean a fully engaged silence that permits us to think, to feel, to breathe, and to take notice. A silence that gives the other person permission to let us know what he or she needs. In nourishing respectful relationships then, we must develop receptive antenna, take on the role of witness, and learn to live in the stillness. At the still point, says T.S. Eliot in his poem, Four Quartets, there is the dance. Birth and death join at such moments, inviting our deep curiosity and our full attention. For the dying, and I believe for the living, the immediate moment is the most significant. Now is always. Thank you very much. on stage for those who would like to. Books are available and can be purchased or charged. And we thank you uh, and thank school for the Harold Hines Fellowship Program. Thank you.